Dr. Crystal here. Are you the medical gatekeeper for your family, but not yourself? Stay tuned to learn how to take back your health with our guest, Susan Salinger. You're listening to Live Foreverish, a show dedicated to helping you live just a little longer. Here's your host, Dr. Mike and Dr. Crystal Gosser. Welcome to Live Forever. Dr. Mike, we've talked about women as the medical gatekeepers for yeah. families. Yeah. Uh, in the past, we've talked about the superwoman syndrome. Superwoman. Yeah, that's what it was. And um, yeah, by the end of that podcast, I was like worn out. So, so you, you guys are doing so much, right? Moms, you're, yes. you're, 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 you have careers, you have husbands that are kind of like kids. You have just a whole bunch of stuff, right? Yeah, I th- I'm glad that we're, we're talking about this today. Yes, and we have a, a special guest joining us today is Susan Salinger. She's a nonfiction writer, filmmaker, and the author and researcher behind Sidelined, How Women Can Navigate a Broken Healthcare System. Sidelined examines the many ways in which some women manage and sometimes mismanage their health care. Susan, thank you for joining the show. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes. So I have the book, everyone, (laughs) and you can see my my post-it notes in there. We'll talk about some of the sections of the book that really stood out to me. Um, I just want to thank you ahead of time. It's a book that I plan on giving to my my sister, my mom, my aunt. Uh, And and so I just want to hear just a general understanding of what prompted you to write Sidelined and why is a book such as yours so important to to my aunt and sister and, and mom <laughs> and, and all the other women in the world? Well, I wrote the book. I mean, it's kind of a, a, a short saga, but many, many, many years ago, I had I agreed to have some uh, unnecessary surgery. I knew it was unnecessary. I knew the doctor was wrong. He wanted to do some exploratory surgery, and I finally, you know, and I got scared. So I said, oh, yes, let's, and I should never have done that. We did the surgery. I was just fine, and, you know, that was that. And then many years later, after I retired, I went back to school and took some classes at UCLA. And for one of the classes, I did a project on women who had had hysterectomies, and many of them had agreed to the surgery, even mm-hmm. though they didn't think they needed it. So that kind of acted as a trigger. And I thought to myself, how, how do we as women make our medical decisions? And that's kind of what was the prompt for the book. And what I did then is I interviewed about 50 or 60 women with different diseases. And I wanted to know, you know, what I sort of extrapolated what they had in common. And it turned out to be a book. So that was after 10 years of research, but it did. Right. Um, okay. So there was, I was going to ask you how long did it take you to gather all the data? Because that's one thing I love about your book is it's data driven. There are facts. There's yeah. a, there are references in the back. I mean, it's just, it, you really put it together well. And I love yeah. that, that the women, some of them were very transparent. So how was that process? of kind of gather, finding the women and and giving them the courage to share their stories. Well, you know, it was so interesting. I had so, the women were so lovely. I went, actually, I, I did it on the internet. I mean, I interviewed them in person, but I found them on the internet. I just went to different support groups and I said, you know, hey, I'm a writer and I'd love to talk with some of you about your experiences. And I got a ton of replies. Everybody wanted to help other women and wanted to share their experiences. And they were so open and it was the interviewing process itself. And I I was really worried about it, but it was so easy. And I, I just what I really learned is the best thing to do is to interview women who you don't know. (laughs) <laughs> a couple of times I inter- tried to interview some friends or even friends of friends, and that didn't work at all because they weren't they weren't able to be as intimate. In fact, one of the women said to me, well, I guess I can tell you this because I know I'll never see you again. And she was right. I mean, it was a wonderful way to interview. So I, I could not have asked for a better group of women or a more informative group, a more, you know, a, a more helpful group. Let's put yes. it that way. Yeah, yeah. So wait, when you when you started the interviewing process, what was the goal with each? Did, did you kind of know the book 
at this point beforehand, or did the interviews and their answers drive the book? The interviews and the answers drove the book. What I wanted to do was see how these women made decisions. Why did they do what they decided to do? And so I had no idea. Um, so what I did is once I extrapolated the five or six points that are in the book, then I did some research because, you know, I mean, honestly, I picked these women at random. I didn't know them at all. And I, I didn't know if they were typical or atypical. And I didn't want to put their responses in the book if other women hadn't hadn't made the same decisions for mm -hmm. the same reasons. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of research, as you noted, and so I found that everything that they had said was supported by, you know, tons and tons of research. Um, it was okay. really interesting, actually, yeah. because some of, some of what I found uh, really surprised me because uh, yeah. I personally don't do some of it. So it was really interesting. So the answers that you got and what ended up in the book are, are very common things. They're not outliers. Exactly. Extremely common, as a matter of fact. And what were what were some of those surprising things that you found as, as you were interviewing, as well as some of the things that you found, kind of those common uh, scenarios? Well, I think the first thing that really surprised me was that women put themselves last. Personally, I don't think I do that, although my, I asked my kids if I do that, and they said, yes, I do. But I don't feel that I do. Um, <laughs> But I found that so many women will take care of, uh, well, the fact, I'll tell you, this is lovely. There was a study done and researchers gave women five things to prioritize. You know, what would they, who or what would they take care of first? And of course, almost all of them, including myself, would take care of their children first. Second, they took care of their pets, which I really loved. <laughs> Third, they took care of their elderly parents. And I, I had to share that with my kids. Being an elderly parent, I thought they put their cats ahead of me. I might have to shoot them, you know. Um, fourth, they took care of their significant others or partners. And last, they took care of themselves, yeah. which means a lot of them delayed going to the doctor. And there's one woman's story in the book. Um, she had had a mammogram and they called her, she had a suspicious something or another, and they called her to come back and she couldn't go in because she, she was taking care of her kid and it was raining and her husband was out of town and, 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 and. And by the time she got there, she had uh, breast cancer that had metastasized. It's, it's not surprising that <coughs> women put themselves last. I mean, we could argue the rest of the ranking, whatever, but yep. I, to, I was... I, was, I could have predicted, you know, women put themselves last. Yeah, well, apparently, which I didn't know until I did my research, we do 80% of all the caretaking in the world. I mean, that's a heck of a lot of, you know, that's, that's worldwide. It transcends cultures. I mean, that's really interesting to me. So that was, you know, the first thing I found that kind of, it surprised me, but apparently I do it too. And really, I think it's probably so internalized and so unconscious that we're unaware of it. I'm pretty I, sure Dr. Crystal puts herself last. I, I've known her for a long time. You know, I I have, this is something we've talked about, you know, as as we mentioned earlier, the superwoman syndrome. Yes. And yeah, there there's a lot of pressure on women, mm -hmm. but I am learning. Your book helped me a lot. <laughs> I really so just bad. have to say that. Um, and I noticed there's, there is a difference how I would approach my health versus my husband. And as I read your book, I, I recognize, you know, when he has a workout schedule and he does not care what's going on, he will stop everything yeah. and he will work out. He will right. go and, and, and take his time. And I used to feel guilty, just like, is it okay? I would ask, is it okay yeah. if I go to the gym, you know, for a yeah. quick class and I would speed to, to the gym do my quick workout class and race home yeah. Yeah. Like, as fast as possible and just <laughs> try to shower as fast as possible and then like get, yes. get everything back on track. Yes. And, and that's just something I think that we're programmed to do. And it adds a lot of stress yes, into, it does. into our lives. And, and so you talk about that role of stress and how does, how does that play into women's health and, and what well, do you think? 
I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I'm no. So sorry. But I think it does. I think, first of all, it's really important as as not only as women, as people to remember that you really can't take care of others if you're not feeling well. I mean, think about when you don't feel good and you're irritable and, you, you know, you're you have no energy and you have no appetite and you're just feeling crappy. And how can you take care of somebody else? I mean, it's really tough. So taking care of yourself first and making sure that you're in a good place, I think will really help you take care of others in an even more effective way than you already do. And stress does, of course, impact our health. Um, I mean, we all have it. You can't right. get away from it, but it does lower our immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no question about it. But, you know, that's why I think, again, taking care of yourself and going to the gym is so important. I'm yes, or, or just, it, it, and that was just one example. You know, it could be so many other things, right. you know, that, right. that you may want to do, spending time with, with friends and just yes. kind of yes. doing something different over, you know, during the weekends. Um, one thing I want to kind of transition to a, another part of the book that you discuss with our relationship with our doctors. Yes. And everything from uh, from communication styles mm -hmm. and and how we how we talk to our doctors, how our doctors sort of perceive us and 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 you give lots of tips there are even handouts on your website. I love the checklist yes. of things Thank that you. that you should should do to prepare for your doctor's visit. Um, so can you share from your interview some of those biggest frustrations that yes. women experience with their doctors? Well, so many of the women I talked with absolutely did not. They, they felt that nobody was listening, that they were unheard. They felt that their doctor didn't understand, had, had pre-ideas, so to speak, about what they were experiencing. Um, I think the best thing to do, and I do want to, I want to say two things. Women and men talk to doctors a little bit differently. And as women, we tend to tell the doctor everything. I and mean, I am so guilty of this. I tell the doctor everything I'm experiencing, everything I'm feeling. And so sometimes that can skew the conversation. And my physical symptoms can kind of get lost in, in, in the emotional feelings that I'm, that I'm sharing. So I think it's important, and this leads me into how you can take control of the interview with the doctor. You, it's very important to write down what you want, to, what your symptoms are, and prioritize them. Go in with a written list, and believe it or not, written is the operative word there. Because if you're like me, you'll get anxious when you go to the doctor, and you'll forget half of what you want to share with him, him or her or them, whatever the word is today. Um, I think it's just really important to write it down. And in fact, I was on a show with a doctor, and she was saying that she prefers it when patients come in with a list. In fact, she told a story about a man that she had examined, and as she was uh, leaving the room, he said, oh, incidentally, I have this mole on my back. So, of course, you know, she turned around because that was the most important symptom that he'd said during the whole interview. And mm -hmm. if he'd had a list, she could have read it and, t and taken care of that first. She would have reprioritized it. So I think that's really important. And I think the second thing, <coughs> excuse me, but <coughs> I'm hoarse today. I think the second thing is to ask the doctor for the clinical name of whatever your diagnosis is and have them write it out and spell it for you. Because if you're like me, you know, you can't, particularly with computers today, I can't spell a thing anymore. <laughs> so have them write it down. That way, when you get home and, or if you have access to a computer, wherever you are, you can research it and think, look up the symptoms. The Mayo Clinic is great. Mayo Clinic, I think it's .org or .net, one of those. And it has an overview of most diseases and it will list the symptoms and see if you feel that, that this is a match? Is this a good match for you? Does it feel right? I mean, listen to your intuition, which is not what I did when I agreed to that surgery. Right. You know, I mean, I could have waited a week. I could have gotten a second opinion. There was a ton of things I could have done that I didn't do. So don't be like me. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the message. I, I'd and like to share my own. See, I'm a clinician as well, and I'll share my own experience. So I, I went through medical school in the 90s and went through my residency in the mid 90s. And I actually, I saw this firsthand. Male doctors, when they talk to male patients, they do so as co-equals. 
They do. Correct. They do so as friends. Right. And they. They. A, a male patient isn't going to bring in a list, but the male doctor is more open to making sure everything is covered that they want to talk about, and they do it very conversationally. But when it came to women patients, um, that the male doctors would often take kind of like a paternal role. Mm. It, it was more. Here's which. Here's the problem. Here's how I'm going to fix it. Bye. Yes. There yeah. wasn't. There wasn't a back and forth at at all. And I witnessed that firsthand. I do think it's better. I think medical schools recognize that, and I think the younger generation of male doctors is definitely better. But my generation, and we're still out there practicing. No, yeah. we, we were. We were taught paternal with women, friends with guys. Huh. Yeah. Do you think that has anything to do with the way women communicate? Because if I'm sitting there and telling you that I'm bursting into tears because I can't take my kids to here or there because I don't feel well, that automatically is going to make you, you know, more paternal, I would think. I think it's I think it's both. I think the older generation of male doctors go into that exam, examination room Already with that idea, oh, this is Mrs. So and So. Da da da. Let me just get this done. Da, yes. da. So they're yes. already going in with that attitude, and then the female patient doesn't speak up as much as she probably should. So it just snowballs. Got it. Okay, that's interesting. That's really interesting to me. Um, and yeah, I do and think it's it's gotten better. I would assume. Yeah. Crystal, I mean, no, and don't don't give me. I don't want to say we were trained to do that. It was just what we saw, what we experienced. And when you're a young doctor, what do you do? You emulate. You 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 mimic right. what you see. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I I think this it's just such an important topic, and of course we're generalizing some yeah. of these things. Yeah. But I I like that the facts that you have. In the statistics that you share uh, about women, and e even with not not getting the routine mammograms, not recognizing the symptoms of the heart attack, yes, and, yes, and how how there are differences in the statistics to to show that there is a difference. But many of the tips that you share, I have to say, for for the men listening, this is for you too. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you are finding you're in a different age group, you also find that like maybe the the older men are treated or, or, or older individuals are treated differently than some of the younger individuals. The ageism and this yes. assumption that they may not really be aware and know what's going on. So yes, you need to to be prepared so that you don't forget anything. And right. my husband says. I go to my appointments like he's he's seeing his primary care physician next week. And we were I, I was excited about the podcast. So I was telling him all about <laughs> everything. I read him a section from the book and, oh, and he, he said, well, I I have an agenda when I'm I go to my doctor. Good like he, he already has kind of done some of his research. I'm not I'm sure that's probably. That's a little bit no, more. The, the doctors probably may not like yes. that. <laughs> right, don't don't right. overly do it. <laughs> right. But he he has he's done his research and he has a general idea of like the different options if it's cholesterol, some of the different options that's mm -hmm. available and one that he may prefer. Uh, and, and so I think that's yeah. also an important part of of the conversation as well is is yes. making sure you're knowledgeable, uh, tap into the resources that's available. Right. Uh, trusted resources, maybe yes. not TikTok, Dr. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just make a plug for my own book here, which I actually rarely do. But at the back of the book, there's a wonderful resource list. I've done your research for you. Oh, and I've listed a bunch of the websites that I used for research that I found reliable. And just so everybody knows, the way I researched is when I came up with a, a statistic that said, do this or don't do that. I, I tried to find two or three other sources that said the same thing because, you know, I didn't, how do I know that the research is valid? So I tried to validate everything that I, that I wrote down and published. Yeah. So everything at the back of the book or most of them. I stuck in a couple that I didn't use because I knew they were reliable anyway. Yeah. But um, 
so don't worry about the research. It's right there for you. It's all categorized. It tells you how to research your doctor, your hospital. And incidentally, that's important. And I think I want to mention that. You know, some hospitals specialize are better at cardiology cases. Some are better at neurology cases. Know where you're going and does it suit what you have. Um, yeah. I th and if you have choices, if you're in a big city, see where you're do with whom your doctor is affiliated and pick help you know so ask about the hospital that you you found is better for your particular condition yeah. I, I like that i and i you know i think you know hearing all this and knowing my experience with physicians myself we need to come into that doctor patient relationship more as co-equals with more conversational where both yeah. sides have a time to speak and both sides have a time to listen um, we don't, we, we don't want to be paternal as physicians, but at the same time, we don't want patients coming in demanding things either because they right. don't always know just based on of course. their own, their own. Research. <laughs> and the last thing I would say, if you have, if you're trying your best to be, have that conversation to, to be heard and you feel like you're not, there's nothing wrong with firing your doctor and finding another one. Let me expand on that for a minute, because again, that's very. This is very important in in helping focus the doctor visit. We talked about writing down your agenda and prioritizing it. We talked about getting um, the the clinical name of your disease and researching it. And another thing that I think is really important, and, and Mike, it feeds into what you just said, is I think it's very helpful to repeat back to your doctor what you heard them say. Yeah. For two reasons. Number one, it gives the doctor a chance to confirm or correct anything you may have misheard. He can clear it up for you. And secondly, it gives them a chance to make sure that they said what they meant to say. I mean, we all misspeak. So it, it, I, I, a, a mind-boggling statistic to me was that 85% of women leave the doctor's office without fully understanding what they've been told. And so I, that is something that you, you can't do that because this is your body and you have to be really, I mean, take care of it. And if you don't understand what you're doing and what you've been told, um, please. Yeah, make sure I love that. I love that. I, I was a teacher before I went to medical school. And, uh -huh. and one of the techniques was always, you know, after you're done presenting something, right, then you ask the student, what did I just say? I mean, yes. what? What, yes. did, what did you get out of this? And you, right. you quickly understand if they got it or not. And so right. now it's like, well, how do I, we don't give up. Now it's like, how do I approach this a little bit differently? Right. So they understand it a little bit more, but being able to put things in your own words successfully is a good indication. You're going to get good treatment. So right. true. Right. So true. You're listening to Live Foreverish. We are with Susan Salinger, the researcher and author behind Sideline, How Women Can Navigate a Broken Healthcare System. Susan, any final words, any final thoughts you would like to share with our listeners? Well, I think the most important thing is for everybody to remember, but particularly women, um, is that, again, I'm going to say it again, it's, it's our body and we're in charge and we have to take care of it. And I think it's so important to have a good relationship with your doctor to ensure that you understand what diagnosis you've received, what the pr prognosis is, what the treatment is. I think that's all critical. And it's up to you to make sure that you understand because nobody can, can, can tell you whether you understand or not. I mean, that's your decision. So I think, and I, the one thing we, we left out and I want to just touch on quickly, which is it very, it's very important to get second opinions mm. if your disease or if your diagnosis is a serious one. And I won't go into why, but that's one of the most important chapters in the book. So please, please at least review that one chapter. Um, again, it's your body and take charge of it. How's that's that? fantastic. Now, where can our <laughs> listeners uh, find your book? It's on Amazon and it's wherever books are sold. And my name is Salinger, which is <coughs> S-A-L-E-N-G-E-R. So All right. it's spelled and, a little differently. And you do have uh, lots of resources on SusanSalinger.com. Right, right. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> It's been a pleasure. And again, Thank you. The, the book is very valuable. Uh, listeners, buy one, share it. This is a perfect Christmas gift. Oh, yeah. hey, thank, gift for the <laughs> thank you again. Thank you again.
<laughs> All right, listeners, if you would like to hear more podcasts, head over to liveforeverish.com. That's liveforeverish.com. We have over 400 podcasts available on our website. Share, comment, like. Also join the Live Foreverish family when you're on liveforeverish.com. And our sponsor, Life Extension, would like to thank our listeners with a special 10% off discount at lifeextension.com. When you order, just type in the discount code podcast at checkout <laughs> and you'll redeem a 10% discount off $50 plus free shipping on your entire order again with the code podcast. Thank you for listening. I'm Dr. Crystal and that's Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike. <laughs> Have a great day.